I want to um, really focus our discussion on the cluster, you know, uh, your role in the cluster, but also how we grow the cluster. That ultimately is what we do at HQ Vancouver. Also, it's, uh, it's about economic development for our, for our community. But let me start by getting a better understanding of the cluster. and Maybe Marcus can help us by giving us examples of firms other than Arcteryx and uh, Lululemon. They, they are two of the most prominent, obviously. Tell us a bit about what else is in the cluster. What are some of the names out there? Um, well, I think when you look at the cluster, it breaks down quite nicely into, you've got the large firms like Arcteryx and Lululemon. Um, the other two in the big four are uh, Aritzia and Mountain Equipment Co-op. They're yes. by far the four largest employers in the space. But you also have a number of medium-sized firms. I mean, Kit and Ace is starting out. Um, yes. You've got boutique firms like Native Shoes. Um, you know, Footwear is another one that's not really given the recognition that it needs. And then, as I mentioned in my introductory comments, you have companies like um, Wing Wing, Tomoda, they're doing contract manufacturing for Kirkland, Eddie Bauer. And I think what, what you need to look at though is, we're doing another project, we need 700 sewers. In 2016 alone, we need to find 700 sewers just to satisfy the domestic demand. So these third party manufacturers are unable to take all of the orders that they possibly can because they don't have enough sewers. Mm. And you know, my favorite company, there's a, a guy out in Pitt Meadows that makes skydiving, you know, high-end, you know, skydive team uniforms. Mm. So if you want to spend several thousand dollars and become uh, a jump master and participate in some coordinated skydiving team, <laughs> you can buy one of these things. Um, the, his, the person who gets the most pay in that company is the sewer who's sewing these uniforms. So that speaks to a need of, you know, this is a job that's really high in demand, but how do, you, how do you fill that gap when, if you go to a high school here and you say to people, would you consider being a sewer if you knew that you were going to get 50 bucks an hour? And a lot of people would say, still say no. I want to come back to the skills issue, the talent issue, and I know we have some people from educational institutions. Uh, Kwantlen is here, we might hear from uh, our colleague later on. But I wanted to stay with the cluster idea for a little bit longer. Uh, you say there are about 90 firms in this cluster. You've given us a few examples already. Does the cluster talk to each other? Do you guys talk to others in the industry? Is there some sense of trying to build the cluster as a cluster, as opposed to simply building your own business? Maybe I can start with John. Yeah, I, I think, you know, as Susan mentioned it, the big four have kind of started talking. Yes. Um, you know, over the last 18 months, I think it was, basically. And um, we, there's always natural competition for, for talent, but we also realize that we just need a much bigger pool to pull from. And we all face the same challenges. Um, and uh, if we can talk as a larger voice, not only um, uh, to, the, to, to the government, uh, but to, to the talent pools, to the universities, uh, it's only going to strengthen you know, our businesses in the long term. Mm -hmm. um, we all want to call BC home. Um, for us, it's super important from a, from a mountain standpoint and an outside activity standpoint. Um, so I think we're, we're starting, but we need to continue um, to, to, to talk as one voice. And mm -hmm. I think just getting us in a room uh, 18 months ago was a big first step, but I, I think there's a, a real shared uh, interest for sure. Do you share that view, Susan? Yeah, um, I would say the last uh, 18 months has been a significant um, development for us. So when I think of the near-term challenges we've been facing on the talent front, I really see more of us um, in conversation about how we deal with those collectively. And where there is um, so much more power I'm seeing in having that collective voice and how we can attack those challenges together. Mm -hmm. So I see that dialogue actually starting to make some change. Um, and I, I, I'm actually looking around the room and I see a ton of people uh, that I've gotten to know over the last 18 months and there's much more dialogue um, than I've ever experienced before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that the only issue? Are there other issues that this group, the big four, are talking about? I mean, I know skills and uh, search for talent and workers is key. Are there other major issues that you're coming together to try to either lobby or to advance for the sake of the cluster? Anything springs to mind? Uh, Marcus even, yeah. yeah I, I think, you know, for us, when we look at um, our risks and opportunities as a, as a company, um, 
talent, not only the attraction, but actually the retention piece is, is, mm. to, is, is, is massive as well. Yeah. So I see a real um, continued investment around developing, helping people hone new skills, whether it's sending them back to school, whether it's um, giving them other opportunities to learn more about um, other parts of the business or other parts of the community. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to get the talent in here, but then you also have to make sure that they want to, they have an ability to grow and, and develop. And, right. and um, that's obviously part of our responsibility as the employer, but then also I think, uh, you know, the local community and the local universities and stuff, there's some cross-pollination and, and idea and best practice sharing there. I think that's important too. Yeah. Let me get back to the point Marcus raised about uh, maybe some prejudice or preconceptions about working in the apparel industry, uh, being a sewer might be associated with a low paying job. I think you've helped dispel that already. But what I don't understand is uh, how long does it take to become a good sewer that you would employ? I mean, what sort of training regime one, does one need to go through? What is the available, uh, what are the available facilities that we have currently? And what are the salaries? That's the most important question. I mean. You know, we are in the business of attracting head offices, not because, not simply because of the head office nomenclature, but it's because we believe that head offices pay higher salaries. They deal with the affordability problem we all are very worried about here. And typically, head office type jobs are more sustainable. They are less likely to be lost in a downturn. Is that true of workers in your industry? Are they paid? better than the average? Susan, you start? Um, yeah, I think it's, it's um, when I look at the roles that make our business thrive, so I look at anything across our product talent, um, that is where we are definitely positioning ourselves and really needing to make sure that our total offering, so whether it is compensation benefits that we are doing an incredible job to attract that talent, um, I think that's part of it. The yeah. other piece of it, I think, is the culture of the organization. So I look at what, I say all the brands here that are representative have done well and what we as kind of our, the heart of our business really um, speak to when we're recruiting people is it's not just about you know, what you want to do in your career, it's about bringing your whole self to work. Mm -hmm. So what are you up to in your health goals? What are you up to in your personal goals? What are you up into your career? And really investing in that personal development. Mm -hmm. So we actually have whole curriculums built around that. So it's when you come, yes, that pay package may be that, that piece that helps get you there, but it's also that culture of the organization and what they offer and that whole ecosystem around it. So that's the thing I think Lululemon's done incredibly well because when people come, they actually grow and thrive and it's part of that because we're investing in their whole, in their whole being. Right, which is why your title is Health, well, Wealth and Mobility. You got it. <laughs> you're, you're head of HR, right? I, I'm a leader in our HR group. Okay. Yes. Okay. Health, wealth, and <laughs> right. Did you want to add anything, John or Marcus? On no, sure. I mean, um, the thing that frustrates me is, I, when it, when was it bad to actually make stuff? <laughs> exactly. You know, we've kind of have this um, um, bad connotation of doing stuff with your hands and. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's a, obviously a huge movement around the makers and, and people wanting to try things themselves and DIY, which I think is which is great. You know, the the longest tenured employees in our company are in our factory. Mm -hmm. um, now, their kids are not coming back to us and wanting to sew. Um, but you know, it is more expensive to have um, you know a factory in Canada by potentially tenfold over Asia Pacific countries mm -hmm. in terms of you know, dollars per hour. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we, with the, through the lean manufacturing kind of implementation, we, what's, what's exciting is usually the workers would get paid by piecework. Um, so if they cranked out, uh, uh, you know, more pieces, the more they would get paid. But the lean manufacturing concept is, is about team. Mm -hmm. The change management it took for us to have everybody in a factory thinking about themselves and then suddenly start thinking about a team and then showing them if the team output was high, that they would actually make more money. Mm. Um, that took us almost two years. So that change management um, was is, is, uh, probably a bigger challenge than actually you know, changing up the sewing lines. And stuff yeah. like so that. there was product innovation for sure, but there was a lot of process innovation as well. We're, uh, we're probably facing more process innovation today where we are um, in our growth curve than we are actually in other parts of the innovation. Mm -hmm. 
But we, we know that we're not going to be able to find sewers off the street that can sew to the level of quality we need. Mm. So in the new facility we'll have, we'll have a training uh, pod that will bring somebody in. So to your, your question, it'll be six to nine months before somebody will actually be on a production line. Okay. But we know that that, that talent's not there, so we need to train and develop it ourselves. Six to nine months is not a massive investment for a $50 an hour job, eh? It's not $50 an hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Not there. laughs> That's what he was offering, though. <laughs> no, if, 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 you're sewing, if you're sewing parachutes, you want to pay that uh, person. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think, think maybe in a moment we can ask the dean from Quantum to say a few words about her program and, and how she sees uh, the training side of things. But I just want to just uh, stay on the cluster development uh, for a bit and ask uh, your views on kind of the organic growth of the cluster. You know, one thing we've seen in the tech sector, whether it's life sciences or uh, digital media, IT type uh, industries, is that the cluster um, regenerates because people leave firms, they start their own enterprises, they may compete with their former employers, but they end up adding to the cluster. Is that happening yet in apparel manufacturing in DC? You want to start, Marcus? Well, I was going to say another piece of the cluster that I didn't mention earlier was design. So you've seen some people leave uh, their current organizations to set up third-party design firms, and they have contracts with Patagonia and Burton. So that kind of design. They're based work, here. But they're based here. Okay. Um, you also have other firms that are trying to I guess leverage that BC outdoor piece and they've put a North American Design Center in town. Mm -hmm. And the lady there was telling us that the only reason they're able to get their designers into Vancouver is because these people are at a senior level that they actually make enough money that they can afford to live here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these people are paid high 100,000, mm. you know, beyond sort of the 150 salary range. Yeah. Uh, and that was the only reason they were able to get them to relocate here. Mm. Um, so I think that speaks as well to uh, the issue of is Vancouver or Greater Vancouver becoming unaffordable when you look at factories, factories, yeah. land use is another big issue. I mean, we have all the property developers wanting to convert everything into condos, but that doesn't leave any land available for industrial use. So now if you want to have a factory of any significant size, you're out past Abbotsford, you're into Chilliwack, and yeah. then you start to lose your workforce in commutes. And that's where Bellingham and Blaine are now starting to draw people out of the lower mainland. And we're seeing jobs go across the border, which again, isn't an ideal end-to-end -end solution. So those are writ large macroeconomic issues that still have to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking to the cluster, I think, that's why I keep arguing is you need a five-year plan. Um, because generally firms are going to act in their own economic interests. You know, they have, they have to get orders out, they have to get their products to customers, they got to deal with their own issues. So how do you look beyond that mm. to, uh, how do you help other firms grow? Right. So where's the next Lululemon or Arcteryx going to come from? Like right now, if those smaller firms want to do their manufacturing here, well, the third-party contract manufacturing capacity, there is none because they're satisfying orders. They're turning away orders because they don't have the workers to, to be able to do what they want to do. So that starts to push people offshore. And if you're pushing a firm offshore in their sort of embryonic mode, what's going to keep them here? Yeah. Are we seeing some spin-offs from you? We, we know, but I don't know if we can talk about Kid and Ace. Uh, we love to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say, um, in generally, I mean, that is part of what is developing yes. within this cluster, is that as we bring talent here, as talent grows up within our businesses, mm -hmm. those people may go on to start their own businesses, and whether, you know, Kid and Ace, or I can think of a number of local examples, I can think of juice shops, I can think of cosmetics companies, mm -hmm. other... Um, Places that, industries, yeah, yeah mm. um, that have come out from people that have been with Lululemon before and continue to be part of our alumni and part of our collective. Mm -hmm. So I think that will speak to how this will actually ga gain its own momentum. But I think there's some things that we can do, whether it be more partnerships with schools, looking at some of the training programs, looking at some of the immigration like challenges, yeah. that we can continue to actually have that grow at a faster rate to reach some of the mar numbers that Marcus showed at the beginning. I yeah. mean, that's a, that's a hefty growth curve. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I, th I think it's going to have its own momentum over time. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
you know, I think it's important that within the organization, um, whether it's your own or whether it's the cluster, that, I mean, culture matters. I mean, you guys spend a ton of time on that. And <clears throat> we aren't going to, you're not going to get rich working at Arcteryx. You're not going to get rich working in the technical outdoor world. That's just not, mm -hmm. that's not a reality. So, it, you know, the culture and the aspect and having, um, uh, giving people the flexibility and the ability to get outside. People come to work at Arcteryx. People come to BC because yeah. they like to get outside. They like nature. They like the commitment that we have to you know environmental causes. So I think that's a that's something that is near and dear to us. And we want to get more involved in too. So as we're building the business aspect, we're not taking away from the environmental aspect. Yeah, I think that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have some time for comments, questions, discussion. I, if I could turn to our educational institutions first, uh, at this table, uh, the Dean of the Quantum Program on Textiles is here, and Joy Johnson from SFU is here as well. Could, could one or both of you say something about how your institutions are supporting the cluster? I'm Carolyn Robertson, and I'm the Dean of the Wilson School of Design at Quantum Polytechnic University. And I have to say how uh, grateful we are for this conversation because uh, the big four and uh, Chip Wilson had this discussion about four years ago and that's how we ended up with the, the donation that we have to build a new building, uh, the Wilson School of Design, to continue to advance this area. Uh, it has been identified for a number of years but we still need to have this conversation because it's growing incredibly and we have the talent here. What one of our challenges is, is that <coughs> we have four programs that feed this industry. We have a degree in uh, fashion and technology. We have a degree in product design, diploma in fashion marketing, and a post-baccalaureate in, in technical apparel design. Our students just, it's like a sponge. They just get sucked into uh, this industry. And we have an extremely high employment rate but we're not graduating enough for you. And we, we hear this loud and clear, so this conversation is an extremely important one. I think our, our grads are certainly valued, but there's just not enough of them. Uh, what we see at the other end is that our incoming students from the high schools, um, they're, um, as you say, even at $50 an hour, sewing is seen as women's work. Mm -hmm. It's seen as low-skill low work. Um, and those kids want to get into business and sciences, and they don't understand that this is where the careers are, this is where the lifestyle is, this is where passion is, and so they're going off elsewhere. And what's happening in the school system is home economics and sewing courses, one to 12, against food. Schools are losing their courses all over the place. So you have nine months to prepare a sewer. They're not coming out of the schools. Mm -hmm. So this conversation needs to happen with kids mm -hmm. to see that they can move on into something extremely valuable. I'm Joy Johnson. I'm the Vice President of Research at Simon <coughs> Fraser University. And um, I think that in terms of our colleague from Kwantlen, um, a comment's been made about uh, the educational side. I'd like to comment on the research side of things, because I, I, I also think there are a lot of opportunities. I, I was really struck by your comment that you know, we have um, partnerships between researchers and the industry, um, people in the industry in Oregon and in, in, in other states. And I think there is a challenge for us to find ways for us to continue to work together. Um, I think that actually um, that the university system is part of the cluster um, and that the uh, research and development that can come out of our institutions, we need to find better ways to work together. Um, we certainly have researchers at, at SFU who are doing work, um, both um, in the area of technology, in the area of chemistry, and looking at um, um, new products as well. And, uh, you know, that's the, that's the next challenge for us, is to figure out a new uh, innovation system where we can share ideas and work together. And um, certainly at SFU, um, as part of our strategy around innovation, are looking for those types of partnerships. And, you know, universities have been traditionally really bad at this. Um, uh, we create a lot of uh, barriers to working together. And I think that, um, you know, we're trying to turn the page on that and find a new way to work together. So conversations such as this are, are really welcome from that standpoint, um, because I think that we can contribute to uh, continuing to grow this. So thank you, all of you, for um, your you. comments thank today. You, yeah. um, 
This is a bit of a negative question, but I, I, I want to ask it anyway. I moved here um, in, the mid, in the early 1990s and spent the first five years of my life in Vancouver taking my son to the hospital to treat various broken bones, which he broke cycling on the North Shore. And every bike that he rode, and just about every part of every bike that he rode, and just about every bike that everybody else rode, was designed and made in Vancouver. Uh, there was probably the strongest cluster of bicycle manufacturers for, for downhill, for uh, cross country and, and mountain biking, possibly in the world. So I'm, every one of those almost companies was bought by some other, by some multinational company. And the cluster just died. Um, so what I'm asking and what I'm interested in is th th these discussions, I think, are moving us forward to, to be conscious yeah. of the fragility of clusters. Yes. But I'm really interested in, in getting your thoughts on what happens if someone comes in and makes an offer for Arcteryx, for example. Well, we're already owned. <laughs> no, we have, we have, we you know we have an owner. I I spoke with the board of directors this morning in, in Helsinki. Um, Arcteryx has been owned since uh, 2002. So um, I think the big thing is is your product or your service has to have such a point of difference and uniqueness, and. The, if the entire value chain supports that, and for us having a manufacturing facility here and the way that we make stuff, that's who we are. That's our point of difference. And today we, we don't feel and we know that nobody else can build a better Gore-Tex jacket than we can today. So we have to stay on the front end of our game from, from that standpoint. And then the value chain supports that. So it starts with the idea and then the manufacturing process is there to cement it. Um, the other thing too is, is you have to run a good business. I think sometimes talented people and talented ideas, if you don't run a good, sustainable, profitable business, then you're subject to being bought and either spun off or, or bought and blown up or whatever. So, um, you know, the, the amazing thing I, I saw when I first came in with Arcteryx is that it was a very disciplined and well-run business. And if your say-do ratio stays the same and your product is so different and your value chain is is part of that, you're, you're, you're really going to be fine. So we, we aren't scared about spending um, money on a factory because things are changing so fast in Asia Pacific in terms of manufacturing that the total cost of ownership of that asset, the physical, a physical asset, uh, is going to be extremely important to us over the next 10 years. I think you're going to see other companies saying, maybe I should have bought a factory way back when. Good. I think Thank you. there's two types of venture capital investment. Because I think if you look at all the, the large or medium to large firms in town, if you're public, I mean, generally your ownership is not going to be local. And if you're private, odds on someone in Los Angeles or New York owns a large chunk of your company. The smart ones leave the secret sauce alone because they know that those companies have been successful because they're based here, they've got their team here. The bad ones start to disassemble and think that you, what you do here, you can do in Raleigh, Durham, or whatever else. And those are the businesses that I think quickly disappear, not because the business physically moved, it's because the team is disbanded and it's lost sort of that creative piece. But I mean, you're right, is I think all, all of the big four are, have major investments from private equity out of the states and the next chunk, the same thing. There's no room for complacency. I think that's yeah. Danny's big message for us. This question from here, please. It's Can you introduce yourself? Please? Hi, I'm yeah. Stephanie Burles. I'm a prof here at the BD School of Business. I teach the sustainability classes in our MBA program and our undergraduate program, or some of them anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I just was reflecting on, um, I do think we're part of the cluster. And I think that we actually need to think mm -hmm. as educational institutions about how we cluster because I would love to have the graduates of your Kwantlen program who then go and work for these guys for a couple of years come back as my MBA students so that together we can work on lean manufacturing and on looking like our part-time MBA students in, in our sustainability class this year we're partnering with the city of Surrey to look at what they're calling Eco Newton, which is a manufacturing cluster, and they're trying to think about how to, to revitalize that manufacturing cluster. Anyway, I think it's just we need to think about how we create 
these trajectories for employees so that when we go to a student in a high school, we're not saying you should take up sewing because you should become a seamstress, right? I'm thinking in the back of my head, my kids are eight and six, and I'm like, I want them to know how to weld. I want them to know how to sew. And my son already at eight just made macaron, you know? And I want them to know these things because that's going to make them amazing CEOs one day. Yeah. So we got to think about that trajectory. Yeah, sure, chip in. Hi, I'm Sharon Greeno. I'm a faculty at the Chip and Shannon Wilson School of Design, a coordinator of fashion marketing, and I just saw one of our grads from the fashion and technology program who started her MBA with you two oh. days ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wait till they're in my class. That's awesome. That's great. Hi, uh, my name is Doug Sheridan. I uh, I make clothing in in, uh, in China, and I make footwear in Africa. So, um, what are the problem? And I also own a factory in Thailand in the apparel business. And one of the one of the things we're talking about here, which I think is great, is this is all front office conceptualizing. It's designers. It's saying stitchers that traditionally wouldn't pay twenty to fifty thousand to get a degree and then go work in a factory. Their BCIT, their their technical college school skill set. So, Mark, because I guess the one question is, is there plans to invest and structure that? Because that's where stitchers come from. I mean, even the fact of Thailand, we have a factory. We're bringing stitchers in from Burma because we can't find enough stitches in Thailand to make apparel. So, so unless we're going to be, you know, open immigration and bring in some stitchers, might be a good idea actually, and that we would have stitchers for factories like uh, like Arc that are willing to invest. But so, I guess the one point is that. I think it's, it's fine to talk about higher education supplying front office staff, which we do a great job of, and the culture will bring them there, of course, but to merely make things in a factory. It's not going to be an SFU, unfortunately, and a Kwantlen, which may actually turn out some of them, of course. It's not going to be them. So is there, is there money concepts to invest in that part of it? Yeah, that's one of the issues that we're hoping to look at through the labor market partnership because we see that there is manufacturing happening here, and it's going to suffer. And it's, when you're talking about you want your kids to experience how to be a welder, there's no trade programs left in high schools because school boards and teachers are afraid, like, I got 30 kids in a class, what if someone cuts a finger off? You know, it, that's sort of the mentality now where we're not exposing youth to the technical stuff. The, the second driver is, even if you talk to people who emigrated here, you know, they worked hard. Your parents or your grandparents probably came here and worked in a trade. But now people are coming and, you know, whether you're running a convenience store or whatever it is that you're doing, you're telling your kid to go be a lawyer, go be a doctor. I mean, sure, we need more doctors, but we also need more welders, we need more sewers, we need more mechanics. That's, those are the critical skills that our economy is founded on. And if we shift just to being services, well, you know, that puts us at a lot of significant economic risk. So. You know, Laura will laugh because we've, we've gone to government and said maybe there are certain jobs where we should just give up on training people locally. Maybe we should run a sewing school in Bangladesh or Pakistan or Manila and just train those people for the, while they're waiting to get their work permits and then they're coming here and they're not tied up in a two-year immigrant settlement program. And government turned around and said, well, you know what, we have all these Syrian refugees coming. Do you want to train a bunch of them to be sewers? And we said, okay, well, the number two industry in Syria is textiles. So if they have a desire to be sewers, great, we'll train them. How many of them also want to be welders? Because we need 1,500 welders. So, but the dribs and drabs of addressing labor problems through 40 people at a time isn't going to make a difference. We need to do it whole scale. And so I would actually argue that if there are there's certain careers here where I think we just have to say, okay, you know what? Maybe the BC high school system isn't the best place to go after the solution. Maybe we do need to look at an international solution and open our borders a little bit more and accept that we're part of a global economy. But another piece of our um, labor market study is we're actually going to do a survey of high school kids, find out what your motivators are, what your drivers are, what your current values are, so we can then map that against what are the drivers in the apparel industry. So when John talks about the culture at Arcteryx or Susan at Lululemon, how can we better market the jobs that exist in those firms? So if we can link motivators, 
so if the students are saying, oh, I'm driven by creativity or freedom of, you know, I don't want to be micromanaged and, you know, whatever value criteria you want to pick, and we can map that to particular jobs and we can kind of do a better career counseling type of piece and say, you know what, these are the five things that drive you as an individual. Well, here's the six jobs in industry that tie very closely to what would be strong motivators for you. Because um, right now, it's, that's not done on a scientific evidence-based basis. It's, you know, I'm not even sure how many high schools even have guidance counselors anymore. Thank you for your question. Uh, it's a reminder that the cluster um, it's not just about vertical integration. I mean, these two companies are vertically integrated, but it's entirely possible for a cluster to have um, companies that do a different approach to manufacturing. Yours, for example, where a large component is subcontracted internationally, but to have its head office here, to have some of the high-end design work here and management decision-making, the CFO, and so on. So there are different ways in which we can grow the cluster. Um, hi, my name is Carlos Leal. I'm a senior consultant with Ernst & Young in the advisory practice. Um, and I'm fascinated by how the industry has been evolving and, for example, the, the adaptation of technology um, in your channels and distribution and optimizing production, things like that. Um, and one of, the, one of the metrics that was, was mentioned was, for example, the number of stores that are being opened, but at the same time, that global expansion. Um, and one of the, I guess, the, the trade-offs that are, is happening um, in, in, the, in the retail industry is understanding um, how do I open as many stores as I can to keep that customer experience uh, at the locations, but at the same time, I expand digi digitally by having e-commerce platforms. H how do you maintain that balance to, ma to make sure that uh, you're not cannibalizing both, but at the same time maintaining that unique experience for the customer? Mm -hmm. And sort of what, what, is that, what is the trend that you see moving forward for that? Um, it's, a, it's a challenge I think all retailers are, are grappling with right now. And I think one question we've been looking at is how does it also expand as opposed to cannibalize? So what we can already see with some of the omni-channel stuff that we've been up to, whether it's having um, devices in the store so that there's a virtual back room for that store manager so that if some, a guest comes in and there's not a size 8 wonder under in stock, well, she can look it up online and fulfill the guest need right there. That may have been something that could have never been fulfilled before. Maybe that guest would have said, no, no like that need all of a sudden is no longer there, but we we're actually able to capitalize on it in the moment. So we're looking at more ways to actually integrate the two and so that she can get whatever she wants, wherever she wants, whenever she wants it. So I think it's not so much that, it's like how do you, how do you leverage it to expand it? Yeah. John? I think um, it's 100% seamless today. You know, we see, you know, we still were up 80% wholesale driven business today. So we see it today where uh, a, cu a customer will walk into uh, a Valhalla Pier as an example and they'll look at something and then they'll very quickly on their phone, they'll do the showroom and look to find them where they can find it at the cheapest price. So <clears throat> it's a big challenge for us, you know, where we aren't 100% you know, vertical and, and owned in the retail um, lens is how do we get our uh, expensive but high quality product in front of the consumers? Our consumers as we just started to talk to them globally, they, they, they tend to tell us they can't find us. Um, now Vancouver, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to find us, but um, it will be a challenge for us to um, you know, stay maintained at, at super high price points. Um, the, the value equation of the product has to stay there. And then it's a big challenge how we get that stuff in front of the consumer because for our product, most people are buying it to do something outside and they might, you know, before they drop a thousand dollars on the jacket, they want to touch it, they want to feel it. Um, so there's lots of things that are happening, as you know, in the, in the, in whether it's um, body scanning and virtual fits and things like that. But it, it's, it doesn't replace the touching and the feeling and does it make me look good and does it fit, does it stretch? Um, that will be a constant challenge for us um, as, as we continue to evolve our own retail, but then also work with our wholesale partners. The wholesale partners, um, it is a challenge because the brands um, see the value of having their own retail channels, um, but we need to support both. We need to support our, our good wholesale partners, and then we also need to figure out how we have a seamless consumer um, transaction, which for an expensive product is not easy to do. I understand the importance of the natural environment here in British Columbia as being a reason for your presence here testing and lifestyle and so on. 
Uh, but I wonder if um, there is also an Asia Pacific angle here. This is a special interest, of course, mm -hmm. of the Jack Austin Center for Asia Pacific Business. Also, HQ Vancouver is putting special emphasis on Asian companies. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a bit about uh, whether our unique connections to Asia, both geography, proximity, but more importantly, demography. Of course, obviously, a lot of Asian tourists come through here a large Asian population with perhaps different tastes, certainly different sizes. How does that factor into your thinking and how is that um, a competitive advantage, if it is one, for your businesses? Susan, do you want to start? Um, I think it's one thing when we're looking at our international expansion and where we go and when we go there. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the influence here, and this is where our home is, and this is where a lot of people have experienced us, mm -hmm. that it actually, we actually have found that there is an incredibly thriving yoga community in China, all throughout Asia, in yes. Australia as well. Um, and that's actually enabled us to go there and have a lot of brand recognition and expand more quickly in that area. Mm. And we've actually experienced that a little more so sometimes even when you look at Europe. There's just that, that knowing of our brand mm. um, that I think it's made it easier for us to expand in that market. Could it be that some of these tourists learned about your brand when they came here, when they studied exactly. here? Exactly. And then when they go back, they want exactly. to buy it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and actually, it. those are sometimes people that when they come to study here and then they go back there, they may become our store managers. Right and they know our brand, they can speak to it authentically, but they're also embedded in the local community. Mm. So they actually know where the best classes are. Mm. You know, they, they know the local guest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John? You know, China, Japan, and Korea are all in our top five in terms of revenue. Mm. China will probably be bigger for us than Canada will be in the next three years. Um, the challenge we face there is we know that, that we are a choice for sure for the Asia, mm. Asian community. Uh, consumer, the challenge for us is that we're seen as a luxury brand, not a premium outdoor brand. And so we have to make sure that um, we continue to tell our message um, that we are not just expensive, but we're expensive and you get amazing value mm, for, for performing skiing and climbing and backpacking. And mm. so we need to stay very true that people understand that we, we, we have a very activity specific focus on our products. Mm. Mm. If you choose to buy it, you know, not for that activity, and so be it. But right. um, we're not, you know, we're not a Louis Vuitton or Arcturus, mm -hmm. and that that that's something that is a constant battle for us. Yes. But it's important. But I actually think that we can use, um, you know, there's so much amazing young people in China that love our brand, and it's such a beautiful large country that has a lot of challenges, especially mm -hmm. environmentally. Mm -hmm. That um, you know, if there's such a potential for a massive movement there yeah. um, that I think can really help that country and help the globe. Um, so that's something we're really paying attention to and that's important for us to, to speak as a premium yeah. outdoor brand. So let's take care of the wild places. We make the good gear to get in the wild places and I really am excited to see about this youthful trend that could just, I think, have an amazing There's impact. an integrated message there. To to the, totally, yeah. and it's good for everybody. Yeah, good. Marcus, any final thoughts? I was yeah. just going to say there was a good article a couple of weeks ago about someone questioning how shopping malls in China make any money because it's not for, people aren't going in to purchase product, they're just going in to try it on and do the touch, do the feel, then I'll get on a plane, fly to Vancouver, <laughs> hop over to MacArthur Glen and buy it there, get back on the plane and go home. So yep. maybe you guys should open stores at MacArthur Glen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that stores in China already, so. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this I think has been really enlightening uh, for me above all and uh, really grateful, first of all, to uh, our panelists for taking the time to share their thoughts with us, to all of you for attending, especially to Simon Fraser, the BD School, Jack Austin Center for being a partner on this uh, series. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, my staff uh, who worked very hard to get this event together. We, we will have more head office conversations coming up, so stay tuned. I hope to see you again at our next session. Please join me in thanking our panelists.